Hello, everybody. Good day. Um, thank you for joining us for this very special session, uh, hosted, of course, by Pekeso. And I'm very honored to be the moderator for today's session, uh, which is, um, I think, going to be interesting because we have two very exciting talent uh, as our speakers. And uh, she'll be, they, they will be sharing their thoughts, their views, and of course, um, you know, some of the experiences that they've had. And uh, today's session is mainly looking at, um, you know, young people at the workforce. Uh, we're going to touch a bit about women in the workforce as well, and some of the exciting in uh, initiatives that Charis and Radhika are, are spearheading in this space. My name is Shareen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of, of GigX Global. Uh, we are a platform for professionals who are looking for uh, fractional work, and we're happy to partner with Perkeso uh, in this event. Uh, so over to you. May I invite, um, uh, you know, Charis to uh, introduce yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, and um, after that, Radhika, the mic is yours. Yeah. Hi, hi, I'm Shareen. I'm Charis, and to everyone. Uh, listening to this session, it's really an honor uh, speaking here. Um, my name is Karis. I'm a consultant with PwC's Field Strategy team. Um, my career interest lies in tech, investments, and sustainable development. I'm very passionate about youth empowerment, education, and reducing social inequality in Malaysia. And in my free time, you find me reading, watching Netflix, or spending time with my pets at home. <laughs> nice, Thanks. nice. Radhika, what about you? Thank you. So I'm Radhika. I'm with PwC in Singapore. Uh, I'm from Malaysia and I recently moved here. I'm with the Workforce Transformation Office in in-house consulting. Uh, my passions lie in people development and change management. Nice. I see some common trends, tra threads between the three of us. So we're <laughs> going to have a really nice conversation. Uh, today's session, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is uh, the title is From University to the Workplace, Building Resilience and Seizing Opportunities. So uh, our two uh, late ladies uh, who are going to speak today are going to, like I said, share uh, you know, very interesting things that they have observed in their transition from uh, being in a university environment to now in a working environment. And I have a pleasure of uh, knowing them while they were in university. So it's great to see now the transition has happened. And, uh, you know, let's get, get, get with it. So uh, the first part of the session is really to sort of, um, you know, get everybody comfortable. Uh, get everybody to know a little bit more uh, beyond what you have shared uh, about yourself. So I'm going to do, uh, you know, some uh, uh, what they call the round robin uh, questions, quick questions and quick answers, because sometimes people just want to know, you know, those uh, very, um, you know, interesting things about you. So the quick question is coffee or tea? Tea. Coffee. <laughs> ah, okay. So I'm with the coffee group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> books or TV? Books. Books, but most recently Netflix. <laughs> cool. Yeah, same. Uh, books and TV for me. Sorry, I put you guys on the spot, but yeah. <laughs> Mainly books, so uh, books win. Uh, what about, you know, places that you enjoy? Do you like to go to the cities where it's vibrant and, you know, you see the background that I have, uh, KL and its skyline? Or are you the nature type that, you know, likes to climb mountains and hide in the in the forest i'm a beach person oh, sorry radical okay <laughs> i'm a beach person so beach through and through really yeah, i'm a, Paris, I'm a nature you? lover i'm a nature mm. lover i love the beach as well um and i love the forest <laughs> so not not so much the city i guess you can get a bit uh overwhelming sometimes well i do love yeah. the city as well but if i had to choose mm. between between both i'll prefer the nature <laughs> Okay, okay, cool, cool. And your favorite pastime, I suppose, is books or TV, or is there anything else? Carrie said that she loved, she, she has pets. So uh, what what you you have cats, dogs? Okay, uh, so I've got a little know, petting zoo at exotic home. pet. Oh really? I've got, I've got a hedgehog, I've got a wow. cat, and I've got a dog. <laughs> and and yeah, they so don't three. quite right. <laughs> because no, 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 they're no. talking about them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I live in harmony most of the time. <laughs> nice. So hedgehog is very unique. I suppose cat dog is quite quite normal. Oh, yeah. Why 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 a hedgehog? 
So it was given to me by my boyfriend <laughs> during cool. Valentine's okay. Day. It was a gift. Oh, right. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's really uh, unique having a hedgehog as a pet. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> difficult to, to take care of. Actually, not too difficult uh, because, yep. uh, you know, they, they, they do like to, to live um, a very simple life, just hanging oh, really? out in, in their cage and whatnot yeah. or in the grass. So, yeah, it's wow. not too difficult taking care of them. Yeah. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, we'll always remember Karis and her hedgehog. <laughs> what about you, Radhika? <laughs> hedgehog, yeah. Besides your books and, I... feet and, you know, what else do you do? I don't have pets, uh, but I love practicing yoga. And recently, nice. towards the end of last year, I took up a teacher's training course. Mm. So that was something that I did during the pandemic. And that's something that brings me a lot of calm and a lot of clarity, you know, despite wow. all the things happening around us. Yes, I, I see, that. I see. So um, do you want to look at it as something that you will do for, 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 for a longer term? Or is this something that you're just exploring? Potentially, I don't. No, yet. Nice. I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So now we know a little bit about you with the quick round robin and a bit a bit, bit deeper about some of the things that you guys are, you know, in, in your free time that you guys do. Uh, I want to then switch our chat into something a little bit more. Um, uh, I'm not, I, I don't think it's, uh, um, what's the word, um, uh, spiritual or deep. But just in terms of very quick um, thoughts about uh, why, um, what, what are the things that sort of motivates you? What are the things that continue to inspire you when, when you are now in the workforce? Uh, so some of your, you know, some of the things that keeps you going, lah, right? Maybe Radhika, you want to start first? Hi, I think Radhika. for me personally, yeah. knowing your, your purpose and your value structure, yeah, um, mm. I think knowing your purpose and value structure is important because I think that guides you towards what you want to do ultimately in, in the bigger picture. Mm. And something mm. that motivates me is seeing kindness in other people. Like, you know, despite so many things, especially now, right, happening around yep. us, I think when you follow pages on Facebook, like, um, you know, the kindness movement, and you you see stories where people are just constantly helping others, and it, it's mm. ordinary people helping others, right? These are not some yep. large tycoons or big companies, right? I think that gives me yep. a lot of motivation because that just reminds us that people are really nice, and people are kind, and there is a lot of kindness out there. So that's something that uh, motivates me. For me, it's uh, the youth. I would say seeing seeing the youth in Malaysia and and in different parts of the world as well, really seizing the opportunity to create impact in society uh, for a better country or for a better future. We've been seeing that quite a lot, um, especially in Malaysia um, and even in in different communities. So even in my church, I I teach the um, the high schoolers and it's really inspiring seeing them you know, wanting to change things and, and mm. wanting to also keep serving the community. So seeing mm. that actually really inspires me and, and also motivates mm. me to keep doing mm. what I'm doing and to also keep um, keep staying connected with the youth and doing what I yep. can to, to help them uh, understand how they can really increase their potential and create mm. a bigger and, and mm. more sustainable change for the country. Mm. Nice, nice. Um, it's good that you know the, um, the elements of the human spirit, the elements of kindness, the elements of connecting with each other, because you know in in the pandemic that we are facing now, people are somewhat isolated in their homes, so um, you have to maybe make a little bit more effort to get connected. Uh, and you know, typically technology is not the best way, lah. You prefer to meet someone, have coffee, have tea. You know, it would have been nice for us to to do this, you know, together. So, um, uh, some of the things that um, I was thinking about with the pandemic, and of course with with young people, um, both of you representing a a, a big um, component of our community. You know, uh, with this pandemic, we are very vulnerable. And actually, our survival is so uh, dependent on each other, more so now that you feel right, because at the same time, you know, you you are protecting yourselves with all the 
SOPs, um, you also expect the other person to also apply, apply the same. And in so doing, you're protecting yourself while you're feeling a little bit more isolated and, and all that, right? So it's tough for some people to sort of process that uh, because there's a lot of changes in our day-to-day. So um, what are some of the things that, you know, um, has helped you cope with some of these challenges? Um, you know, share with the audience the things that you've done that you felt was um, useful, meaningful for you to cope with all these, um, you know, things that we have to live with today. What do you think, Harris? Well, for me, it all starts with the mind. So, I mean, we all know that the pandemic has really thrown everything off tangent and mm. there's so many things that we cannot control. So for mm. me, what my underlying principle or belief is, is to really uh, remind myself to focus on what I can control. And so that brings me to, mm. to what I do uh, specifically. So first is really making me time a priority. So uh, mm. I've been working out more constantly. I've been um, trying to do a little bit of yoga, <laughs> meditation, um, and nice. also reading or, or watching Netflix, right? Doing whatever it is um, that would give me a break. Yeah. Um, and the second one is really building relationships with close family, with friends, and also mm. with the outside world. So we, mm. we even have MDEX Malaysia Tech Month, we've got uh, the Per Castle yeah. Conference. And I think this is really a good way for us to also connect with um, with others around the world or in different parts mm. of the country to broaden, up, mm. broaden our perspectives, right? So that's the second thing that I do. And the third is really practicing yeah. gratitude, acknowledging my mm. privilege and doing my best to help others who are in need, whether or not it's um, dropping them a message on WhatsApp to check in with them mm. or even looking at, um, you know, who, which underprivileged groups are really severely impacted and where I can, yep. uh, you know, contribute in any way mm. or shape or form. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, there's, so there's very much linked to the human spirit and empathy, mm. kind? Yeah. Uh, understanding and trying to understand what it's like for the other person and reaching out yes. in, in any ways that's possible, kind? Yeah. Yes. Mm. Mm. Radhika, what about you all the way there in Singapore? How have you been coping? Okay, not too bad myself. I think the first, I echo Karis, right? Um, really taking yeah. care of yourself. I think you can't pour from an empty cup. And something I learned mm. during the pandemic is I learned about myself more, right? Mm. You understand mm. yourself better. You understand what makes you tick. You understand what motivates you. You understand what are the things that, you know, inspire you or bring you down. And mm. I think that is very powerful because I think that's also mm. part of, of, you know, uh, maybe growing up and trying to figure things out as, as you go along. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of that is really to, I, I really believe in when you serve or when you help others, right, you shift that feeling of um, powerlessness to a feeling of power. And mm. you feel that, you know, that although the situation looks so bleak, right, and today mm. if you look at the news or if you look on social media, there are so many situations no. which, so which many is just, you know. Toxic yeah. conversations also in Twitter and all that yeah. if you follow them, right? Mm. Absolutely. Mm. So can then you. if you think, how can I shift that to put myself in a position of power to help others? And it could be okay. your friends, your family, it could be immediate community, your alumni, mm. you know, your network, mm. and then the broader society. I think that would make you, you know, a lot more resilient in this uh, vulnerable mm. situation. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Which is nice because I think um, the, the generational sort of dynamics, because I'm seeing it from my generation and I'm hearing it from, from both of you. Uh, the sense that I get is that um, young people are more resilient. We always say it, but when I have conversations with young people, the way you talk about how you face uh, the situation that we are all in. Um, you know, I'm very hopeful that you guys are the strong sort of, uh, you know, the next generation that's going to take this nation forward. Thank you. The, the people in my generation, I think we worry a little bit more uh, because of the so the commitments that we have, we have children, we're not sure about, you know, their future and things like that. So the different, different, uh, you know, different worries and, and coping mechanisms. But you're right, we can learn from each other. Uh, and I'm learning from uh, both of you today, Radhika, you can't pour from an empty cup. Wow, that's quite a powerful statement. You have to take care of yourself first. 
then look ab- around you and see how you can then you know share share that blessings and and carries as well uh, what you've shared so the building resilience part kind of nicely you know brings us to this um, the, the next uh, part of our chat today uh, and the topic is building resilience and seizing opportunities mainly for young people because there's a lot of young people out there that's tuning in thank you guys so uh, you know the building resilience part uh, at a personal level we heard from you um, now you as professionals uh, and and having worked uh, what about five years or so now is that is that the tenure okay good you have a long way to go in your career by the way so I'm happy that you're starting in such a great place you're going to go uh, even you know higher higher places uh, you know god willing so uh, you know when, when you move into the the workplace uh, being women tell me what what it's like number one uh, to transition from student life where you know sometimes the priorities are different and then moving into a working environment as a professional and then what it's like uh, as uh, being what young women in the workforce uh, open to to uh, either one of you to start off. Maybe Karis. <laughs> yeah, so um, the transition from university to the workplace, uh, it's definitely something that was very exciting um, because mm. there's a lot of unknowns as well. Um, mm. I've done research um, and I've spoken to people while I was in university to better understand um, what it's like in the workplace and what are the different options I can I can get. So I would say the whole transition was really exciting, eye-opening. Um, and what really helped was speaking to people, even doing internships um, and just having a very curious mindset that really helped. And in the workplace, the nature of my work involves um, working on various deals, m and deals around industries. And, and that is pretty much aligned with my interests at this point of time. It also gives me a sense of purpose, knowing that each deal that I work on is actually helping with my clients' growth um, and to a larger extent, the growth of Malaysia, the economy as a whole. So that's what it's like, um, you know, the transition from work, uh, from, from university to the workplace um, and mm. what it's like uh, currently at work. And mm. as Was a it? woman in... Yep. Sorry, go ahead. Karen, 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 sorry. Karen. <laughs> Yeah, so as a woman in the workplace, I would say my, my team is particularly diverse. We actually have a very good representation of um, male and, and female. And um, even the, the leader in my business unit is a, is a woman. She's a very strong, strong woman, um, very inspiring. And in PwC Malaysia, I do get a lot of support. Um, there's a lot of uh, benefits that's tailored to also supporting women in the workplace. There's a lot of... Um, activities and programs that also uh, helps to really empower women. So for me, the experience has been very positive, very empowering. And, um, you know, I've really been learning so much um, where I'm at now. Nice, nice. Was it difficult to transition though? Because in university, the dynamics is different when you yeah. work in an organization like PwC, the culture is quite different, okay? Yeah, I would say at the start, um, it was a little bit difficult because uh, what yeah. we learn in, in university is uh, very academic, um, mm. very much theory, but in the workplace, you really need to adapt and you need to be a very mm. versatile professional. And we also rely a lot on, um, on, the, on the softer skills. So there's a saying that goes, right, your IQ brings you um, that far, but your EQ mm. is what brings you further so that's what mm. I actually learned in the workplace, um, mm. which, um, which I felt was really eye-opening and, and that really helped me to get a better grasp on how, how to really thrive in the workplace. So I would mm. say there was a, a gap um, mm. and we can talk about that a little bit later, but, um, but essentially having um, soft skills and really also getting involved in other um, non-academic uh, work while you're in university actually helps because then that's when you deal with more people and in the workplace, you're dealing with people and to be honest, people mm. are the toughest things. <laughs> it is the most difficult part of the job as well. Doing the job is the yeah. tricky part, but really yeah. um, managing people, managing stakeholders, that is something that does take quite a steep learning curve, especially mm. if you're fresh from, the, um, from university. From university. 
Radhika, uh, response to that question and a follow up question was: Was it something you imagined to be? No. So the first question, and then was it something you imagined it to be? So a quick answer to the: Was it something I imagined it to be? <laughs> no. I think okay. what you think of the workplace and what the workplace mm. actually is can be quite different. So I'll yeah. give a bit of backstory, right? So I studied accounting. Um, I went off to do an internship in audit. Decided I didn't like it at all. And then it was a big question mark, right? Because I'm going to graduate. I don't like the most popular destination for accountants. So what do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> so fortunately, at that time, I was in the Toastmasters Club. And I had this mentor who was working at EY, which is where I started my career. Yeah. Um, and he introduced me to advisory, right? So I didn't know consulting existed or I knew very little about it. And I didn't yeah. know it's something that fresh grads could actually join. So I started to like dig a bit deeper and find out. But even then, when my when I joined, my first I think my first six months of work was probably some of the longest and some of the hardest growth and learning curve I would say and to mm. date, because it is learning so quickly on the job. Right, I was put mm. into the oil and gas industry, which I had absolutely no experience and no knowledge about. Right, mm. and I had to really learn on the job. Right, even things mm. like taking good meeting minutes. You don't learn these yeah. things in university, right? Yeah. Or things yeah. like, you know, managing, like what can I say, managing stakeholders. You don't learn these things. So, you know, to the listeners who are going to transition to the workplace, right? Just mm. know and expect it will be a gap. And mm. there are things you can do to minimize that gap, but don't expect it to be just, it's like getting into a cold pool. Like when you go for a swim, right? The first mm. shock is very sudden, right? You're like, oh my God, mm. the water is so cold. But after you swim mm. for a while, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. fine. Yes, and I think especially now, because, so I remember when I started my career, we had people from engineering, from law, from accounting, all join uh, consulting, and then you can imagine everyone's growth curve was very different, because yeah. they had to yeah. pick up different things, and I had to pick up, so I think then that, that support system when you join mm. work is, is so important, your colleagues, mm. people outside work, your alumni, your friends, your family, mm. you know, and knowing where to go to get that support. I think that was mm. something that sort of really helped make that uh, transition a lot easier. Mm. Mm. Which also sort of, um, you know, um, is important in a workplace because sometimes we don't do enough of that support role for each other. And, and, and it happens in every, uh, you know, type of organization, whether you're new into the organization, you've been there for youngs or, you know, you're about to leave. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that you found that as, uh, as important and then sort of take ownership of that lah, because I think, you know, when you join the workforce and, and I'm trying to remember when I started the, the, you know, in my career journey, you got to just go and get it, right? You, nobody's going to give you whatever. Yeah. Nobody's going to be, you know, telling you the basics. They don't even tell you anything. Just get on with it, right? So, so that's, that's uh, good. So I think the support uh, in, uh, system internally in your team and with your uh, larger colleagues in the organization and then externally with all the other peer groups that you are involved with um, helps a lot in, in that transition. Um, but was there anything specific that you did to prepare yourself for this big transition, this big movement into the workforce? Uh, what were some of the preparation uh, in your mind or what you did that helped you? I think first knowing that it's going to be a big shift. So I didn't know it's going to be such a big shift. I thought it was just mm. like, you know, you know, in uni, you go from first year to second year, second to third year. And then you think it's like third year to fourth year. It's not, it's like third year to 10th mm -hmm. year or something like that, you know, <laughs> not to scare the <laughs> listeners, but, but that's sort of it. So I think just knowing that and then prioritizing that you will be spending a lot more time learning. You'll be, you will need more downtime on weekends um, and talking mm. to different people. So to me, it was yeah. like, so I had a mentor, right? I, I spoke about that before. And I think trying mm. to connect with people who have been working here a bit longer and trying to figure out, you know, mm. what do I need to succeed? How do I learn quickly? Who are the people I should connect with? You know, what mm. resources will be helpful? So just those kind of things which don't come in any manual to you. Like when you go into mm -mm. university, you're given this manual, right? And then you're told these are the, your units and this is what is expected of you. This is your assessment. <laughs> in the workplace, it's mm. totally different. So I think mm. having that understanding and then 
all the EQ things Kerry spoke about, so important, right? So learning yep. how to understand your bosses and learning mm. how to, to work strategically with colleagues, right? How can mm. you leverage off each other's strengths and how can you mm. work better as a team? Because today we mm. all work so collaboratively. Um, I think yeah. these are some of the things that, you know, that kind of helped make mm. the transition easier. Karis, what about you? Anything to add from there? Yeah, so for, for me, what really helped was number one, to plan. So mm. I am, uh, I really love planning and I think that really gives me clarity on what I should mm. prepare for. However, um, my mindset is that if things don't go according to the plan, I pivot mm. or I adapt, right? So that's the okay. first thing, really planning and, and understanding what needs to be done um, by when, or who you can leverage for support, who you can seek to, right? Um, and second is really having that sense of curiosity um, okay. and asking the right questions because you know, after a few years in the, in the workplace um, and, and even being thrown into very ambiguous situations, thrown into projects with, with uh, let's say, uh, that, that are from completely different industries, I would say mm. asking the right questions is something that mm. shouldn't be understated. So mm. as an undergraduate, when you want to transition, let's say to consulting or you want to explore maybe um, a career in data analytics or whatnot, think about what mm. are the key questions that you, want to, that you want to ask that will help you get better understanding of that specific career or to help you get, um, um, get a higher chance of getting the job during that interview. Mm. So really mm. having that curious mindset, asking the right questions. And I would say the third thing is really... Uh, Leveraging on having your own support system. So like Radhika mentioned, she had a mentor. I also had a mentor. In fact, my, my mom and my dad, uh, you know, in, in a way, they are also my mentors, in-house mentors. Your life coaches, I would say. Yeah, 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 life coaches. <laughs> yeah, so really leveraging on their wisdom, their knowledge, um, to yeah. also get a different perspectives. And then from there on to make my own decisions um, or even to have friends who are going through the same journey who you may want to bounce off ideas with and exchange, um, exchange information. I think um, that is very mm. useful as, as well. So these are the three things that um, I actually uh, leverage on, which help me to have a smoother transition um, mm. to the workplace. Now that you've tra transitioned and you've um, experienced the work life, um, uh, what is it that you, you know, enjoy doing most in the uh, you know, in, in your work, besides the, the relationship that you uh, strike with your colleagues and all that, what brings you joy at work? Chris? Well, for me, <laughs> for me what, what really brings me joy at work is um, knowing that the work that I do really helps create impact for my client or the target mm. that they are acquiring. So the target is typically mm. a, a company or it could be a startup or it could be an SME in healthcare or whatnot that they are looking to mm. acquire or invest mm. a stake in to grow their business. And, and for me, it's, yeah, it's something that brings me joy because knowing that I'm creating this type of impact for the company and, and, and to the larger extent, um, the country as well, that that really brings mm. me joy. And at the same mm. time, um, because the nature of my job involves uh, doing projects mm. in various industries, it could be airlines, to tech, mm. to education, to even healthcare, um, I feel very uh, privileged to be able to have exposure to all these different industries, to understand yep. what the key drivers are, the key trends in the industries are, how each company um, uh, you know, can be built to... Uh, built for success in the longer term and helping to identify these, um, mm. in a way, opportunities for success. Mm. These are, this is knowledge that I really appreciate at this, uh, at this point in my career. And yeah, this is something that really brings me joy as well. At work. Nice. Radhika, anything to add uh, from that from your experience? Impact and impact in the people. So for change management, mm. we really look at the people side of things, right? Yep. And so, for example, when I see someone successfully transition to a new role, um, you know, and see mm. how their ways of work have changed and it has really impacted. So it's not just um, the company or the organization, but also the people who, mm. you know, who, who are being positively impacted. That is something that brings me lots of joy and it motivates me to do, do better at my work. Nice, nice. Uh, because you guys are involved in work that has 
um uh you know a, a deeper value or a deeper meaning to it right so so the work brings you a lot of um motivation and, and, and happiness it's good it's good um not a lot of people may be as privileged i think or as as lucky uh but i think if we are focused on what we want to do with our career we know where we want to go um seizing opportunities that's the second part of our title right seizing opportunities is where you need to then invest a lot more time and and you know in in some it will take a bit longer for you uh, you found it in in your first uh, phase of your career so so that's brilliant but you know the 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 big um, learning is that you know always building resilience in yourself and seizing opportunities and and i like what um caris you said about you know um uh, uh, you know having that opportunity for nation building having the opportunity like radika says to create impact So those are the kind of um, elements, you know, in in your workplace, in a job that you do that uh, keeps you motivated and and happy. Uh, I'm just going to switch a little bit onto um, bit dive the deep the deep dive onto our topic, uh, and and sort of unpack it a little bit for those of us um, who sort of have you know gone through it. Sometimes um, you take it for granted. But you know, we'd like to hear from from you. Um, you know, when you talk about building resilience, and we spoke about that quite a, a bit uh, earlier. Uh, you know, you see it in theory, as in you read about it, and you're curious about it, and then you learn, and then you put it in practice. So, besides what you shared earlier, is there any um, other sort of thoughts that came through that you want to share with us? Uh, on on building that resilient part from from knowing it and really living it and practicing it. Uh, Karis, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Well, on the topic of resilience, I would say in theory, to me, uh, what it means is really the ability to thrive in the face of challenges and uncertainty. And this is what mm. we are all experiencing right now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but translating it into action. Resilience means mm. having a growth mindset to me, okay. uh, from I can't to I can. So from having a limiting belief to really having that growth mindset um, and also knowing that whatever it is that you endeavor to do, that you want to do, there's always a way to achieve it, mm. always a way mm. to, to get that goal or, or to change the world. <laughs> um, yeah. And having that sense of... Um, positivity as well or, or optimism not blind optimism but really having yep. um, optimism in the face of uncertainty I think that is something that will really help um, myself personally uh, from my experience mm. to pull through a lot mm. of challenges so mm. um, yeah one thing that I want to share with everyone is really having that growth mindset especially during challenging times that we are facing now yep yep for me I would I, I always say say yes first and figure it out later because the opportunities will come at you right you can't say oh i'm yes. not sure i don't know like yeah, maybe later mm. yes. say yes yes first figure it out later because there will always be knowledge out there for you to acquire mm. people out there is going to help you to 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 build upon you know what you what you need to do yeah kan okay? yeah radika what, what do you do when, when you think about you know resilience as a theory and then the yeah. practice part of it in your day to day I think as a theory, it sounds very nice. But I think the Good. practicing part is not as easy as, you know, as you said. I, I'm learning every day, right? Because I feel like mm. this environment is forcing us to be resilient. It's no longer a choice. Yep. You have to mm. be, right? And when I think about resilience, what I'm trying to think about is don't look at opportunities and challenges as two separate things. Actually, every challenge can be an opportunity. It's about reframing. So if we look at the pandemic, right and mm. to many people it may seem like a challenge and it really mm. is right it really is on so many fronts but it also brings about so many opportunities when we look at it from different aspects right whether it's from healthcare or whether it's from a social aspect or even economic aspect we have seen how businesses have boomed during this period and how digitalization mm. has taken over so i think viewing them not in silos but viewing opportunities and challenges as the same thing but depending on your frame it's not easy but yeah. i'm i'm trying to and i think that is something that can help actually incorporate resilience into our day to day life 
Mm, mm. You know the cat, uh, the Chinese character of crisis is also opportunities, right? So I learned that from the mm. uh, Chinese culture. Fabulous. There's this, um, you know, really nice mm. saying that a crisis is an opportunity. And to keep positive is that, okay, we're in a crisis, right? You know, we, we don't want to like mope about it. Where are the opportunities you can find around that, that sort of um, challenge that's been thrown at you? Right? Um, uh, you know, some of the things that we were uh, thinking about as we were designing this uh, session was also to look at, you know, um, uh, the creation of those opportunities. And you spoke a little bit about it. Uh, maybe you want to go a bit deeper on how would you then, you know, sometimes the opportunities doesn't just come to you, you got to seek it out. Uh, Radhika, in, in your personal or even your, your professional sort of, uh, you know, life now, um, how would you seek out those kind of opportunities? Because you got to go out there and make yourself out there and be present and, and, and you know, go for it, right? Sometimes when, you know, what you're looking for doesn't exist, then create mm. it. Mm. So, you know, I'll give the example of the project that we're working on and then we'll talk about it a bit more later, right, in detail. Yeah. But mm. uh, essentially, you know, we've started this Impact Catalyst social initiative and the whole idea is to increase social consciousness and social impact at the same time, increase youth employability. So one of the motivating factors is when Carries and I first got into the workplace, we found that gap, right? So we found mm. that gap between academia and the workplace. And then as mm. we went along these few years of working, we realized that that gap is very prevalent. It's not something just the mm. two of us you know, experience. So mm. there's a gap, right? And you can choose to do something about it. You can choose to do nothing about it. Uh, we chose mm. to start coming up with programs. So we're currently working mm. with students um, at Monash mm. University, final year students, through a 12-week program that where they work on a real case uh, scenario, you know, mm. um, based on a UN Sustainable Development Goal to solve a problem faced by a company. So nice. essentially, it's, it's if you don't see what you want, create it. And I think in today's environment, right, whether that is a business, whether it's a social initiative, whether it's just, um, you know, a social media page to create awareness about something, it could be something, it doesn't have to be something super huge, you don't need to incorporate a company or anything like that, but it could just be something really small that you start. And I think Harris will also share a bit more about other initiatives we've done, right? Um, but yeah. if you don't find it, take it upon yourself to create it because that is something very impactful and you get to feel that impact too. Mm. Mm. Karis, you want to add on to that? I'm glad you, yeah. you now are talking about what you have created because that's a really inspiring initiative and we want to hear more. Yeah, perhaps I could also just backtrack a few years back <laughs> to 2018 okay. to give you a better <laughs> understanding of of what actually transpired before that. So in 2018, mm. uh, Radhika mm. and I were the co-presidents of the Monash Malaysia Business Alumni Chapter. And we were actually sent to Monash University, Australia to, to present our views and propose solutions on closing the gap between academia and the workplace. So we did actually mm. do some research. We sent out surveys to employers and, and employees in the workplace as well to identify what the gaps were. And here are some of the results, right? 44% of fresh grads uh, were actually lacking clear direction when applying for their first job. Secondly, 76% mm. of fresh grads said that the biggest challenge for students really was the lack of relevant experience in their first job. And if you look at internships, right? Ironically, you, uh, you know, employers actually look for fresh grads with experience doing internships um, mm. right off the bat, but not everyone can get um, the opportunity to do internships, right? So, yeah. so how do you get work experience when, when you know, you're fresh, off, uh, fresh out of university? So that's a, a big question mark as well. Mm. And the third point mm. is that from the perspective of employers, right, 80% actually indicated that resilience and adaptability was crucial in advancing one's career. So that's why this topic is really important. So these were the mm. outcomes that, that we got from our survey. And we mm. were looking at how we could um, think of a solution to bridge that gap. And we were actually very um, inspired by MIT Sloan's um, pedagogy, mm. which is learning mm. by doing. So MIT Sloan is uh, one of the leading universities in the US. 
um, uh, they run MBA programs. And what they do is mm. they actually have this thing called action learning, where yeah. it's, it's very similar to micro internships, but you do it mm. while you are um, studying in university. And, and these MBA students actually get to do it, I think about three to four times during their um I think two-year MBA program, and that really gives mm. them the opportunity to bridge the gap from um, between academia and the workplace. So we thought that, hey, this is a very interesting proposition, and it's something that we wanted to share with Monash University Australia as well. Mm. So that was 2018, mm. and, and that was really what started the, the topic and also helped to add some data and, and cement that gap that Radhika and I saw, right? Yeah. And so in... Um, I think about two years later, we actually were in touch with uh, our university lecturer, um, mm. Ms. Priya. So because we've got a very close relationship, we also shared this idea with her. And nice. it was that moment um, that we actually took the opportunity to share it with her. We didn't know if she would take up the, um, the idea or not, but we really wanted to show her that, hey, you know, this is what we we discovered. And we think that this will really create impact for Monash University in Malaysia and and it's something yep. that is not very common, common among local universities yet. Mm-mm. And then fast forward a few months later, she then reached out to the both of us um, mm. to really work with her to curate um, this new unit that she was running um, for the second time. Um, it's called uh, Ethics and Sustainability in a Business Environment. So how nice. it's meant to work is that um, she has the unit and then we have our social impact project which runs in tandem with the unit and the social mm-hmm. impact project actually comprises a 70% weightage to their overall grade um, nice. and like what Radhika mentioned it's really uh, giving them the opportunity to work with host companies to solve mm. real issues so these host companies mm. could be for profit it could be not for profit we've got about mm. eight of them on board and um, we even have mm. um uh, an emerging startup in the uh, sustainable fashion industry that uh, that nice. students have the opportunity to sort of um, work work with, right? And all of these mm-hmm. are linked to the UN Sustainable Development Goals because, sure. again, our two main goals for this program is to increase students' employability skills and to really build yep. socially yep. responsible graduates because we don't want leaders who just care about the bottom line, care about revenue, profitability, but we also want leaders... Yep. Um, for the future that also cares about the community around them, what decisions would then impact other, um, other elements in the country, in the entire ecosystem, because we want a more sustainable future. We, wanna, we really want sustainable development in Malaysia. And so yep. this is what the, the program is, the social impact program is. And on top of the project-based learning that uh, we are helping to design, we will also be running workshops to help prepare them for their career. So these are workshops that right again, I wish we had when we were in university. So examples yeah. are understanding self. So, so this is where we'll mm. teach them about uh, perhaps the Johari window, helping them to better mm. understand their strengths, uh, their mm. weaknesses. Um, mm. And the second type of workshop is problem solving. So we all know that problem solving is essential in, in work, in our personal life, but there's also a framework to it. So this is something that yep. we um, will be sharing with the students, mm. effective communication to even planning your career. So that's the fourth type of workshop that, that we'll be having as well. So as you can see, these are, um, these are topics that we are equipping the students with so that their transition from university to the workplace is, is smoother. And it also helps to broaden their perspectives to understand the impact of what they do in a business environment, um, how it actually really has a ripple effect to other parts yep. of the ecosystem as well. Yep. So yeah, yep. that's a little bit about what we're nice. doing right now. Nice. Uh, you know why it's uh, very exciting is because it's designed and curated by you guys who are really very close to the situation, right? It's not coming from somewhere else and it's totally disconnected to what's happening on the ground and, what that, and, and all that, right? 
So well done. You need to create more of it and like work with all the other um, universities beyond Monash maybe and make this into a national platform for people to, young people to prepare for the workforce. Radhika, you want to share a little bit uh, some of the projects uh, within that, that, that um, you know, the social impact that Karis was talking about, um, uh, you know, the clients and the actual projects that the students are exposed to? Yeah. So I will talk about the sustainable fashion um, mm. startup, right, that, that Kelly spoke yeah. about. So very exciting startup that was also founded by a Monash alumni. And I think something nice. interesting we've noticed, right, amongst all these startups, they are actually founded, a lot of it are founded by young people who are working mm. full time and pursuing this on the side. So yeah. when I say pursuing this on the side, it's actually having two full-time jobs, right? And they mm. find so mm. much meaning and so much fulfillment in this. We actually have two fashion uh, startups that are both being nice. you know, done, pursued by founders who are doing this on the side. So mm. Um, mm. that really looks at sustainable fashion consumption. So something that even okay. I learned is that when we look mm. at sustainability and the environment, we think about oil and gas. We think about mm. saving electricity. We think about saving water. But all of us wear the clothes every day. obvious industries, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, we all wear clothes every day. We are all consumption. We all consume fashion. And mm. I think today, fast fashion, with its reduced mm. prices and you know increasing mm. trends, have just yep. made our um, consumption preferences a lot more different from what it used to be in yep. the past. Yep. So if you think back, you know, maybe to our parents, grandparents, or even when we're younger, I think sharing clothes was something very common, right? If someone okay. had a kid, mm. then they would pass their clothes over. How common yeah. is it today? Or even when you're Not older. And mm. if you look at if you look at other countries, for example, when I was studying in the UK, you have these charity shops where really nice mm pre-loved clothes are being sold at reasonable prices, right? And yep. it usually goes mm. towards a charitable organization. How common is that in an Asian culture? Is it, is it acceptable to wear something, you know? And, mm. and why not? You know, if that's the case. Mm. So these are some of the things that, that this business is exploring. And they want to use social media, a digital marketing um, plan, to see mm. how can we understand consumption preferences among young Malaysians and how do we mm. then convert them to try these options out for the first time, right? So how do you, mm. for example, mm. change a Zalora fan? Because you have all this 9, 9, 10, 10, 11, 11, and people just go crazy buying, oh, right? Oh my, but yeah. Then, yeah, how do you... How, like do you how make... many black jackets do you need in your cupboard? Like, <laughs> not 10. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> carry on, carry on. Sorry to interrupt. But no, no, no. <laughs> but 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 that's but that's the whole point, right? The whole point is then mm. how do we convert that thought process and how do we use social media to do it? So I think the students have a very exciting challenge because they're working in a space that relates to them very much. Um, mm. And also with a group of people, the demographics that are actually their age group and that their target market, right? The whole yep. millennial group and how do we want to influence the way that they think about fashion? So that's that's one mm. of the examples that I thought was actually quite interesting, um, mm. you know, and got us thinking as well. Because sometimes when mm. we look at uh, sustainability or we look at the sustainable development goals, it sounds very far and foreign. But what we're mm. trying to help these students see is that it is part and parcel of our everyday business and our everyday lives, right? Life. And in mm. everything that you do, incorporating sustainability into it shouldn't be a separate thing but it should be yeah. part of what you do it should just be it should just yeah. form the framework for your thought processes um, and if you're yeah. able to do that then I think that would be excellent yeah good that you're addressing the the fashion industry because if you look at the value chain of the fashion industry from say your your very basic cotton t-shirt right the production of mm -hmm. cotton and how much water it's mm -hmm. used, you know, arable yeah. land and things like that, right? So, so sometimes you're right. Uh, we don't notice uh, the obvious ones that staring in your face. Then we want to like, you know, do things that is larger. And then in the end of it, you kind of get lost because you don't know where to start. You don't know, you know, what is important because everything seems important. Uh, I'm I'm so glad you're that you're you know very passionate about um integrating sustainability in the lifestyle and the choices that we make whether it's fashion food uh, you know uh, whatever that we surround ourselves with. Uh, do you find that that a lot of young people are going into this profit with purpose um mindset? Uh, you know the momentum is 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 building up or is it you know already a, a big uh, movement? Here in Malaysia, I think, at least. 
I think it's it's definitely building, and I think that that awareness is really growing. You know, when you mm. have units in university that already tie sustainability with business, I think that's a good start. Yep. And then when you yep. have students who are so keen, you know, um, our lecturer Miss Priya shared with us some examples of her past cohort and how they went on to have careers in sustainability themselves. So they never heard about nice. this before the unit, yeah. and so that's very yeah. very inspiring, right? Because mm. then you have a whole um, generation of people who look at businesses differently with a different lens mm-hmm. and I think that is mm-hmm. important because you, mm. you can no longer like what Carrie said it's, it's no longer just about the bottom line right but it's about yeah. really truly understanding how does my business or how does this business impact society how does it impact environment mm. how does it impact the things mm. that go on around us yeah mm. mm. Carrie you want to add on a bit to that is there some points that you yeah feel very passionately really... about that you want to share mm. <laughs> Yeah, I would say Radhika really did a great job with uh, sharing the background of what we're doing. Uh, in addition yeah. to sustainable fashion, we're also working with, uh, with a bank, um, looking at mm. how to help this local bank be a leader in a sustainable investment in the future. So we're also looking at ESG for, for banks. So that's really nice. exciting. I think having the, for students, having the opportunity to look at issues like this, look yeah. at um, thinking of solutions at such a young yeah. age, is really crucial for their growth and their exposure because um, mm. if you look at, let's say, um, US grads, right? Um, mm. I think that what, what they have, which is quite different in their curriculum versus what we have locally is the exposure to different topics um, yep. and also the opportunity to really share their opinions and yep. having that environment to be unafraid to challenge ideas, to share yep. ideas, to create ideas, yep. because this whole sense of um, having a, an environment to really have discourse, discussion, and ideation really helps with coming up with new products, new services, and then these new products and services could then be evolve into make new startups, and yeah, it makes a, mm. make a better world, right? And mm. this is something that I also heard from the recent uh, Malaysian Tech Month organized by MDEC. Uh, I'm not so sure mm. if you've heard of Prof. Michio Kaku, but he's a very yeah. well-known futurist. He's yeah, a so futurist, did, yeah. Yes. So he did mention that, you know, what is crucial for helping to drive um, innovation and growth in, in a country is really the culture and its society. And so having that type of avenue to come up with ideas, to have discourse mm-hmm. and challenge is important. And that's what mm-hmm. we're seeing in this unit the Monash University, and we hope to see this more in other universities in Malaysia as well. And to your point or to your question Mm. on whether or not there are more Mm. youth that are having the whole profit Mm. with purpose mindset, I would say yes, it's definitely growing, but we want to nurture it more. We want to see more of um, youth looking at profit with purpose in Malaysia as well. Mm. Mm. So you're creating this um, uh, value system uh, that's beyond just the financial returns. Uh, you're yes. creating a group of young people who have, um, you know, who can master problem solving skills, analytical thinking. And then when you have good problem solving skills, you can analyze things, then you can create solution. Then you become innovative, creative and all that because your, your base is actually critically thinking about the issues in this country, in yes. the world, whatever. And how you, you know, turn that into a solution. So a crisis into an opportunity, going back yes. to what we were saying earlier, can? Uh, yes, we're finally well, coming but... to the end of, yeah, right? Thank you. But, you know, you guys <laughs> have, have brought the ideas all together. But, you know, what you're doing is, is, is very noble and important and much needed. Because I think um, the future of the country obviously lies in your hands, the future of the world. Um, the, the, the people of my generation may have caused some of the, would have caused some of those issues that you have to deal with. So, you know, um, you can count on some of us uh, um, who will support you to, to move your, your organization forward or your initiative forward and, and call on any one of us uh, to support you because it's, it's, it's very inspiring. Uh, we've got only about, um, I don't know, about three, four minutes to wrap up, but we're really just getting into the topic, right, guys? Because this one, we can talk yeah. forever. Oh, it's yeah. so <laughs> amazing. Okay. 
so I just wanted to switch back to the adversity and opportunities, the crisis to opportunities, and maybe link back to employment because you spoke about that earlier. Were there any other thoughts that you wanted to share with the audience um, about turning a crisis into opportunity uh, in, a, in a context of uh, employability, in a context of employment in an organization? Anyone? Yeah. Maybe I'll go first. So I think mm. for fresh graduates today, right, those who are listening to this in the middle of a pandemic and a lot of uncertainty, um, be creative. So maybe what you're looking for is not out there. See if that's something you can create for yourself, if that opportunity is something you can create for yourself. Um, don't think in a very uh, stereotypical fashion in terms of what a career looks like because that's changing every day. And Puan Sharin is the best person with your DX Global, you know, maybe you want to share a bit about that as well, to talk about how the future of work is changing, right? Yeah. Be creative yeah. as to come up with a series of experiences. Just focus on the experiences that you're building and you're growing, and that will form the entire path for your career. So if you're mm. graduating today and you're applying to hundreds of jobs on LinkedIn, you know, yeah. um, and you're not getting good responses, don't worry. Take it as an opportunity to create something for yourself and build something that you would want to become mm. a part of. Mm. 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 Yeah. So thank you for, for the segue on, on the platform that we've created. Uh, it's important. It, it's um, you know coming through exactly the, the thoughts that you shared, uh, Radhika, uh, because you know the platform that we created is an ecosystem. So uh, yes, you find opportunities. Yes, you would find uh, projects or jobs. But uh, here's the thing: while you're waiting for the opportunity, there's also modules for you to upskill or reskill or go into a new skill that you want to uh, explore. And we have our uh, skills partners uh, on on board. People like Link. In and Nicole. Uh, we also have modules to help you save uh, when you do your projects because there's, you know, uh, you, you get something, you need to save it for, for a rainy day or for your future or invest and, you know, modules to help you with uh, mental wellness, mental health, uh, and career advisors. Um, so it's a whole uh, holistic ecosystem. So that's a little bit about the service that we offer and we offer it for young people as well because. I know, you know, it's much needed. And, and there are a lot of other uh, opportunities out there. Uh, Karis, um, uh, anything you want to take off from what Radhika has said and a little bit about the future of work um, as we uh, come to the close of our session? Yeah, I would say that um, in, in regards to the future of work... We're not right, hearing you, of... Karis. I think Oops. you're... Yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in regards to the future of work, I would say that... Oh, um, if... still not. Oh, Is it me or... I can Radhika? hear her. I can hear her. Is oh, okay. Carry on, carry on then. Yes, yes, carry on. Okay. Yeah, so in regards to the future of work, I would say we can see it in two parts, right? One is looking at the more technical side of things. So understanding what are the, the hard skills that you may want to pick up, be it coding, be it data... Uh, analytics, machine learning, whatnot. But there is also the softer set of thing, things or the human skills, right? And I think that the human skills is what everyone needs to have as a baseline, as a foundation, because that is what differentiates us from the AI <laughs> bots, right? Um, and I think that for undergraduates, um, as you are transitioning into the workforce, this is one thing that you can bear in mind as well. Look at developing your human skills, um, but at the same time, number two is then looking at um, expanding your, your knowledge to see how it would then help you with your next phase in your um, next chapter in life, right? So, of course, going to GigX to check out what, um, what you can leverage on in the meantime. I think that is a very good next step after this call. And I would say the third point is really on, on the mindset, right? Because a lot of things that we spoke about today from resilience to having a growth mindset, it all starts mm -hmm. with the mind. So just remember that you need to focus on what you can control. You are in control of, um, of the knowledge that you consume, uh, your attitude towards adversity, towards other people, and even the actions that you take. So I think that is a very important takeaway that I would also like to share with everyone to focus on what you can control in this whole time of uncertainty. Mm. And I think when we focus with what we can control, it will take us through for post-pandemic, right? 
because yeah, we have trained true. our mind and our our way of thinking to really focus on what really matters. Okay. Okay. Yes. So so we're really coming to a close. It's been a wonderful one hour with both of you. I love the way you think, the way you, you know, take the thinking into real solution and real action. So uh, kudos to you. Well done. Uh, or last last thoughts. Do you have any before we officially close, or uh, anything else you would like to share? I know I know we've talked a lot already, but you know, a, a, any other last last thoughts that you have? Not lost thoughts, but last thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having us today. I think it's such an honor for both of us to be here, and thank you for listening to us. The last thoughts would be: don't give up. It's not an easy time. We understand it. Don't give up. Keep looking and something will come your way. Whatever it's meant for you. Yeah, last thoughts from my end is really to take action. So there's a lot of things that you can change in the world. Um, some people choose to complain about their circumstance, uh, but some decide to take action. And I encourage you to be the one that takes action. I encourage you to really be the change that you wish to see in the world. I know it, it may be a very cliche statement, but for me, it's something that, that really um, motivates me and also inspires me to really um, do things differently um, and not to just sit back and relax when you know, problems are all surrounding me. So surrounding that's, us. Yeah, surrounding us. So that's one thing that, um, yeah, that's, that's my last parting thoughts for all of you who are Thank listening you. in this call. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you so much, Juan Shireen, for this session. No and thank you to Marqueso yes. for having us. It's truly an honor and a really a real privilege to be here and to be able to share with all of you. The feeling is the same. We look forward to more Karis and Radhika out there yes. uh, changing wow. the world and, and making an impact. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this has been uh, you know, a one-hour session uh, brought to you by Perkeso, part of the International Public Employment Services and Symposium. Uh, there are a lot of other talks uh, going to be streamed. Uh, I, I encourage you to uh, look, look out for it, but I have a feeling our session is one of the best. <laughs> with that everybody thank you ladies thank you Karis thank you Radhika um, and thank also you. a special thanks to Pakeso for bringing this together thank you so thank much thank you everyone thank you goodbye take care Bye. stay safe